Over the years, I've somehow managed to develop the habit that I don't watch television very much. And occasionally, when there's some special thing on, I'll turn it on. But otherwise, I spend a lot more time on the computer. And so I'll say I spend a lot of time on YouTube, whether it's professionally, because of course we do our broadcasts over YouTube, and I have to go back and check them out, and check out the competition, of course. Or for other entertainment purposes, I'm on there a lot. And just as an aside, I'll tell you, YouTube has done a really good job of monetizing its content. It's amazing how many commercials you watch when you watch YouTube. Bizarrely enough, you can watch our services after the fact, and sometimes they will be interrupted by commercials. It's very weird to hear me at some flight of rhetorical fancy and suddenly go to a commercial and then come back to myself again. I, I, I don't know what to make of this experience. But it means that I have seen a lot of YouTube commercials, and this morning I'm thinking of a couple of them in particular that I've seen lately that really struck me as having something important to say. These are from a company called BetterHelp, which does online uh, uh, mental health counseling. I, I assume it's by Zoom or whatever m modality they use, but it's remote services of that sort. And they have lots of commercials, and some of them are very straightforward. They tell you about the product, they tell you about the company, why you should use their product, a standard commercial. But the two I'm thinking of are not like that. They, are, they have no words in them at all, really. They're, for the most part, they're just the, the picture that you see, the, the, the action that you see, with a little bit of indication at the end what company it is. But you don't even know what company it is until the very end. What you see instead is this youngish guy doing things in his apartment. There's one of them where he's making an omelet for himself. And it is very calm and sedate. It's well lit. It's a, a clean, well-organized apartment. You see him chopping up the vegetables and scrambling the eggs and making the omelet and then sitting down to eat it. And the other, he's cleaning his apartment. He's making the bed and cleaning up the pillows on the couch and vacuuming the carpet and cleaning off the counter in the kitchen. Uh, and it, it, what it says at the end, the little message you get is that watching somebody else's self-care is helpful, but doing your own is more. And that's really all you get as far as a message about what's going on. It's only really after the fact, as you begin to digest what you've seen, the ideas that are in it, the images that are in it, what it was meant to, how it was meant to make you feel, how it did in fact make you feel, to begin to figure out that this company was pretty clever with these ads. Not only is it advertising its services in a very indirect sort of way, but it's also doing a kind of public service advertisement for what it means to have an environment that it, it, improves or supports your emotional well-being. But you only really figure that out after you've stopped and thought about it for a while and probably seen the commercial several times. I think, in a way, Epiphany is kind of like that for us as Christians. There's the knowing, as in the commercials, you see what the guy is doing, and you, you, you can understand it cognitively, okay, now he's vacuuming the carpet. But there's also understanding that comes later, that in some way this is supporting him in being calm and happy. Well, same is true for us. Christmas is about knowledge. We see that a young woman has a baby in difficult circumstances. People come to her assistance in the form of these, these raffish shepherds and others who hang around in stables. And then these odd foreigners come with impractical gifts. You have all these facts. We can know all that stuff, but it's only when we begin to unpack it over the course of Epiphany and indeed over the course of the year that we begin to get a sense of what God is up to, what all of this means spiritually for us and for the whole world, these things that God is doing. And I think that also is a good way of getting into the story that we hear in the Gospel this morning. There's a whole lot of knowing going on, but I don't think there's a whole lot of understanding happening, at least not yet. Now bear in mind, this is very early in the Gospel of Mark. It's chapter 1, verse 21. You may know there is no nativity story in Mark. There's no Bethlehem, manger, angels, shepherds, the whole business. The Gospel of Mark is always in a hurry. It jumps immediately into Jesus as an adult recruiting his first followers. 
So this is barely into, well, here's the guys who are going to hang around with him, and here's the first place that he goes. He goes to the synagogue in Capernaum on the Sabbath. Now, Capernaum is a place where he was known. So in a way, this would have been the local kid who is apparently now doing something new, showing up on the Sabbath, and apparently being able to do something no one expected him to do, teaching with authority. We have to wonder, what did anybody in this scene make of this? There plainly was a, a crowd in the synagogue, a, a, a congregation. It was the Sabbath, so people would have gone to worship. And you notice what doesn't happen. Sharp-eyed readers of the gospel, those who know how these stories usually go, will know that when Jesus did this in other places, when he showed up and did some miracle, as he does in this case, healing a man with an evil spirit, it starts a riot. The people rise up and want to throw him out or maybe kill him because he's done work on the Sabbath, which is not allowed. But in this case, they don't. They're just amazed. They have seen, they've, they've got the knowledge. Well, here's this person we knew who we didn't think could do this kind of thing, and suddenly he's doing something that puts him in a whole other category. They haven't really had the time yet to unpack what it means and come to an understanding of it. I'm afraid that once they finally did, once they got home and were having lunch or whatever they did next in that day and began to chew on it, they would have come to the understanding, oh, that wasn't right. We have rules. We have policies and procedures. You can't do that on the Sabbath. What are you doing? What was he doing? We should have been angry. They, they sh they'll come to an understanding, but I'm afraid it's going to be a negative one. It's going to be an understanding that somehow, wait a minute, God is acting in a way we didn't predict, a way we didn't really want. And we had better start pushing back. So there's knowledge in the moment, and in a way, they respond as they should have. It's like, wow, this is amazing. It's only later with the understanding, perhaps, that they come to what we would have expected of them. Then there are the followers of Jesus, these this group of people who've only really just begun going around with Jesus. And again, there's something strange here because then and now, right down to the present day, a rabbi would not have gone around recruiting followers. Rather, if you wanted to listen to a rabbi or follow a rabbi, you would have gone to that person and begun following that person. The followers chose a rabbi. It wasn't the other way around. So already the followers of Jesus know this is going to be something different. This guy has chosen us. This isn't going to be the usual following a rabbi, hearing the teachings, hearing him spin stories based on a line in the Torah. This is going to be something new and different. They got the knowledge. I don't think they yet fully understand what it is that Jesus is leading them toward that in fact is turning the whole world upside down that Jesus intends. Turning the whole order of evil and death inside out to begin to accomplish what it is God desires for the world, which is healing and mercy and peace and justice. I'm not sure that's what they were signing up for. I'm sure that's not what they thought they were signing up for. And it's only going to take the rest of the story for them to figure out what it is they have been recruited into and what part they will play in it. So there's those, there are those characters, but then there's the one that I think is the most interesting, which is the man who is healed. You'll notice he doesn't say anything. He's got no speaking part. We have no backstory for him. We don't know how long he's been in this condition. We don't know what he thinks of his condition because he doesn't ask Jesus to do anything. In other stories, someone will say, Jesus, Son of God, heal me. Have mercy on me. This man doesn't. So we don't really know what his knowledge is. What does he know about himself? We kind of wonder, has he been living inside his head with his demon all the time, trying to throw it out? Have they been kind of had a condominium going inside him and maybe one gets a little more room and the other gets a little less? We don't know. We don't know what happens when Jesus heals him. The evil spirit comes out of him, but does he know that there's been any change? 
Did he think that his life before was normal, even though plainly it wasn't? And now he has been changed into someone or something new. What does he make of it? We can't tell. We do know, however, that as is in the case with anyone who is blessed ever by God under any circumstances, the blessing isn't just a one-day, one-time thing. It happens, but then it has to be lived out day after day after day for the rest of our lives. So of all the characters, this man is probably the one who is best placed to begin to develop understanding. Nothing negative, not that he doesn't want it, not that he signed up for something he wasn't going to want to follow through on. He's been changed in some way. Now he has the, the joyful task of figuring out who he is now in the eyes of God, who he is now in the eyes of his neighbors. He has the best chance, I think, of truly recognizing and making best use of the blessing he has been given. So, dear friends, who are we in this story? Are we the nice church people who are just waiting for the chance to tell God, no, that's not the way we're going to do it? No, that's not what we want. No, that's not what we, what we set up our system to do. Please think again and do it the way we want it done. Are we the new followers of Jesus who are a little bit infatuated, maybe? but who are in for a rude shock when we discover the full scope of what it is God desires to do in our lives and through us in the world? Or are we the one who is changed in some way by our encounter with Jesus and is able faithfully and humbly, but lovingly, day after day to figure out what that means? I can tell you, dear friends, going back to my commercials from the beginning, God is already rearranging the furniture. God is already vacuuming the carpet. We have only to notice it in our lives, to see what God is already doing. We have the knowledge. We see the, the, the clues and the hints around us. Now is the time to begin to develop the understanding, to see what it means, to see where it is leading to see what it is that God intends for you and for me and for all of creation. Amen.